All right. A writer, an activist, a public speaker, a cooking instructor. You may have seen her on the Food Network or heard her on KQED. And uh, gosh, she's written so many books. So, I guess it's you were an English lit major, right? So, yeah, master is in English lit, so that's why you can write. Okay, you can diagram a sentence on that. Okay. So uh, the books uh, include, you know, the uh, highly acclaimed books, The Joy of Vegan Baking, The Vegan Table, Color Me Vegan, The Vegan Daily Companion, 365 Days of Tips and Inspiration for cooking, eating, and living compassionately. 30 Day Vegan Challenge, the ultimate guide to eating cleaner, getting leaner, and living uh, compassionately, and on being vegan. And uh, what's the title is from Excusitarian to Vegetarian. Uh, and from Excusitarian to uh, vegan, Vegetarian. Addressing the blocks and debunking the myths that keep us from making changes. And all of the uh, animal consuming vegetarians in here, by the end of the hour, let's make that change and let's all go vegan. Welcome Colleen Patrick Boudreau. I didn't know if anyone was going to show up. I figured I'd have a captive audience with the vendors. <laughs> Nobody showed up, so I'm glad you're here. So me and the vendors. You can hear me okay? No. Oh, I don't know what to do. Can you hear me okay? Hold it closer. Got it? You can hear me in the back? You're good? Okay. Give me like a thumbs up or something if you need me to go higher. Sorry. <laughs> He's like a thumbs up. Thumbs up if it's good now, and an index finger up if you need me to go higher. Okay, all right. Okay, I can't go higher. I'm going to be screaming at the people in the front row. You can hear me. You got me, okay? It's going to depend on everybody else in the room being quiet because this is a very unique situation. Hi, everybody. My name is Colleen Patrick Adrew. And the mission in my work um, is to empower people to make informed food choices to debunk myths about veganism, to be a voice for animals, and to give people the tools and resources they need to live according to their own values of compassion and wellness. And I say that because I am not asking anybody to live according to my values. I am urging people to live according to their own values. And I really know that people are interested in this. I think that people are quite desperate to make a change. And we see people making changes all the time, and I'm incredibly encouraged by the changes we see people making. I think there are enough reasons out there. People know why vegan at this point. I think we have enough reasons. Some people choose it for health reasons. Some people choose it because they don't want to contribute to what is most likely the most violent industry on the planet, where we are literally paying people to kill day in and day out, become desensitized to their own compassion, become desensitized to the animal suffering. Some people might be interested in not wanting to cut down the rainforest to create grazing land for cattle. We might be interested in not wanting to pay the government to kill wildlife at the behest of ranchers. You may not want to contribute to global depletion. You may not want to contribute to all the resources that it takes to breed and keep and kill animals. So I always say pick a reason, any reason, and any one of them would be reason enough to move in this direction. So I think people know why vegan. I think that information is already out there. Where I think people really struggle is in the how vegan making the transition, and I really see that's where I play my role, that's really where I see the value in my work is that I really guide people to make the transition and to do it joyfully, and to do it healthfully, and to do it confidently, because there are so many myths and misconceptions out there, and that's really where, um, why I'm here today. So I've been speaking here at the VegFest for quite a few years, and I travel and I speak, and it's nice to not have to get on a plane to speak um, to an audience, but last year I decided to give a different talk so I figured, well, if people have heard this talk before, you know, I've got other things to say, as those who listen to my podcast know. And so last year I decided to give my talk on etymology. And it's a very interesting talk, if you ask me. And a very lovely woman came up to me afterwards and she said, God, I brought my, my friend here and my sister and you didn't give the talk you gave last year. And I'm so sad because you're usually so funny and my friend fell asleep. <laughs> 
talk is for you. It's for you. No pressure at all. Okay, so there, it's such an important talk because there are so many myths out there. We have all of these people, I think people who have the challenges becoming vegan, going vegan, are because of a number of reasons. We live in a culture where we're given the message several times a day that we should be consuming as many animals as possible, right? We should be consuming as much meat, dairy, and eggs as possible. We live in a culture that doesn't make it easy for us to make the most healthful choices, to make the most compassionate choices, actually makes it hard for us to do so. We live in a world that in many ways embraces animal exploitation and abuse and looks upon those who oppose these things with suspicion sometimes, sometimes derision. And so one of the things that makes me so sad is that we do live in a culture where we encourage children to be compassionate, right? I mean, it's one of the barometers we use for mental health. We know if a child is kind to an animal, it's a really good sign. We know if a child is not kind to an animal, it's a warning signal. And we use that as a determinant for their future, how they will be as an adult, and we know people who hurt animals will go on to hurt people too. So we know the links between the violence, and yet we become suspicious of people when they're adults and they're compassionate, right? We call them sentimental. We might call them very emotional, right? We're kind of suspicious. She's a little, she's a little compassionate, a little too compassionate. She likes pigs and, you know, it's, she's a little, it's a little much, a little much. Like, like you could have too much compassion, right? Like could you get too much, a little too compassionate. I want to know what it would look like to have too much compassion. Like I want to know what the consequences would be of having too much compassion. And yet we're kind of suspicious of compassionate adults, certainly those who identify as vegan. And I think most of us can identify with the process of going from an innately compassionate child to a desensitized adult. I think most of us had the same experience. My experience is not unique. I grew up, you know, the kid who, who helped a bird if they fell out of a tree and who, who stayed up at night when my dog was crying because she was scared when she was a puppy or when she was sick as an adult, I stayed up with her all night, right? When, you know, there was a stray dog or cat, I brought them inside. I mean, everything I did um, was because I didn't want anyone to suffer. And my parents supported it. And the people around me, the adults around me, supported it. I was the kid, see if you could identify with this, you had images of animals all over my pajamas, all over my clothing, all over my lunchbox, my wallpaper, stuffed animals in my bed. I sang songs, I played games, I read books, I watched movies that had animals in them. And these were not just for entertainment, they were didactic. These were animals teaching me how to be kind, the fables we use to teach us how to be social creatures, right? How to be generous and, and share, but also how to read and how to count and how to spell. All of the most fundamental skills we learn, we learn from animals. And I was that kid. But what I didn't know is that I was being fed animals. The very same animals whose images were all over my clothing, all over my room, in all of these, in all of these works. I had no idea, and when I asked my parents, I don't get it, why doesn't think, and they go, they're here for us, they're suicidal, apparently, they're suicidal, animals all over the place, running to their deaths so they could die for me, these are the things we tell ourselves, I mean, it sounds so absurd when you say it, right, but these are the kinds of things that we say to keep up with the status quo, to stay in the status quo, and so what happened is that compassion that had been so fierce and so unconditional uh, began to become compartmentalized. So I compartmentalized that compassion, and I compartmentalized the animals into those I loved, those who lived with me, and those I would eat, and those I would pay to exploit, etc. And so I went about my life, and I continued to eat animals, and I want to say that I was happy and no problem, but that's not true. There was always something gnawing at me. I always felt bad. I made excuses. I made justifications. That comes from, you know, just being uncomfortable with what you're doing, and I did that until I read Diet for New America, started me on this journey, I became vegetarian, and then eventually I became vegan. Interestingly, the response my parents had to my being a compassionate adult was not the same response they had as when I was a compassionate child. They went, hi, that's so sweet, how precious, you don't want to eat animals. It was, what did I do wrong? What have I done? Why can't you eat the roast beef? I made it for you, all of these things, right? So you're met with this defensiveness, whereas before you're met with really praise. And yet what's so striking about that is that it was the very same compassion. The compassion wasn't different. There's not a different compassion in terms of substance. It's the same compassion. It's just that the recipients were different. And we don't live in a society where we value 
chickens and turkeys and goats and pigs and cattle for their own sake. We value them for what they taste like, what they can do for us, right? So that's what I experienced. You know, I went on and, and, and everything's fine and here I am. However, the message I received was that I should choose convenience over compassion, that I should choose status quo over my own values. And so, in addition to the messages we get from the industry and the message we, messages we get from our family and our own stuff, this is why people struggle and this is why I talk about the social aspects probably more than anything else because people really are fighting against, you know, the status quo out there. So that's what I want to talk about today, some of these myths. These myths are around nutrition, the myths are around food, the myths are around the animals, and, and these are the things that we carry with ourselves that basically stop people from making the changes they really want to make. And that's why I say this is about extend, literally extending our own compassion and manifesting it in our own behavior, because I believe that people already want to do it, they just <clears throat> they struggle with how. So, of course, nutrition, one of the most prevalent categories of myths we've got. Um, of course, everybody, nobody cares what you eat like when you're not vegan. Nobody, you, I double Big Mac and it's triple fries and people, great, where's mine? And you tell them you're vegan, they go, oh, really? Oof. <laughs> That's scary. Be careful. Where are you getting your protein? You know, all this double crap, right? But nobody cares. Everybody's concerned about your nutrition, like once you become even vegetarian or, or vegan, right? Nobody cares however you eat when, when you're eating just the worst possible things. <laughs> so, um, so we've got these myths and so we ask these questions and yet the problem is we're all taught that the nutrients we need are animal based, right? That's what we're all taught. So we're all taught that we're supposed to get our calcium from what kind of milk? Rat milk? Dog milk? Goat milk? Cow's milk? Milk. Animal milk, right? And we're told we're supposed to get our omega-3s from fish and we're told we're supposed to get our protein eggs any, right, all of it, flesh and secretions, all. And so the problem is not where do vegans get their protein? The problem, the question that we need to be asking is why are we going through the animals to get to the nutrients that the animals get because they eat plants, right? We don't eat carnivores. We don't eat the animals who eat other animals. We eat the animals who eat plants, right? And these are the animals who eat plants who get the nutrients from the plants we go through the animal and we get, barely get the nutrients, but that's what we're doing, right? The bottom line is the nutrients we need are plant-based, not animal-based. The only nutrient that's not plant-based is vitamin B12, but it's not animal-based either. It's bacteria-based. B12 grows on bacteria. So I say again, the nutrients we need are plant-based, right? The problem is we're going through the animals to get to these nutrients, and what we're doing is we're going through the animals, so we're getting the saturated fat, we're getting the dietary cholesterol, we're getting the animal protein, we're getting the lactose, none of which is necessary, most of which is harmful, and if we skip the middle animal and go directly to the source, we skip all of that, we get the vitamins and minerals and nutrients and phytochemicals and antioxidants and the fiber and the folate, all of the things that we need, all of which are helpful, all of which are nutri nutritious, right? That's what we need. So the problem is we need to skip the middle animal because it makes no sense from a health perspective, it makes no sense from an environmental perspective, it makes no sense just from a resource perspective, right? I mean, if you take a look at calcium, so you said calcium, we're supposed to get it from cow's milk, right? Well, what is calcium, first of all? Mineral, very good, very smart audience here in San Francisco. Not so much in Tucson. <laughs> oh my God, the people in Tucson. Just kidding, I love Tucson. Um, just kidding, I love Tucson. Um, so calcium is a mineral, and where are minerals found? In the ground, in the earth, in the soil. Right? And why do cows have calcium in their milk? Because they eat grass. Because they eat grass. Because they're eating the foliage that has the calcium and all the minerals in it, right? Now that's theoretical, because three out of four cat, cows, not cats, three out of four cats, three out of four households with cats, three out of four cows do not eat grass. They're kept on dry lots. And so they're not getting the calcium from the greens that they should be getting, that their system is built for, right? But so that the dairy industry can live up to the marketing claims that it makes about being a high calcium food, what do they do to their feed? They supplement their feed with calcium. Calcium supplements. 
You could supplement your feed with calcium supplements. Just a little, little supplement, right? Or not, just go to the leafy greens and get your calcium that way. But that idea that we're going through all of this, again, from a resource perspective, an ethical perspective, because we're, we're, and we're supplementing their feed with calcium makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And so what you have here, instead of just going to the leafy greens, you've got a cow and she has to be pregnant in order to lactate. That's the, that's the basis of the dairy industry, whether it's the goat dairy industry or the cow dairy industry or the buffalo dairy industry or camel dairy industry, and there are those industries, whatever it is, they have to be pregnant. And I remember the day I learned that cows have to be pregnant in order to lactate. And I felt really stupid because I was an adult and it hadn't occurred to me because no one had told me, no one had encouraged me to think this way, that cows have to be pregnant. Our language doesn't even support that. Our language says we say cows give milk, right? We don't say we take their milk. We don't even say they lactate. We say cows give milk as if they come into the world ready to bestow upon humans their nutritional gold. This is for you, take my milk, this is for you. I mean, that's kind of the perspective we have, right? And so, it's not true, it's not so. They have to be pregnant, and she's pregnant for as long as a human is pregnant for. And with all of our anthropocentrism and all of our arrogance, one thing we do admit is that humans do not corner the market on maternal affection. And so we know, we suspect, that that cow, at the end of that pregnancy, at the end of that nine months, all she wants is her baby. That's all she wants. Nothing else matters but having that baby and nurturing that baby and nourishing that baby but she's not allowed to. The baby's taken from her immediately because we have to take her milk, right? And if he's male, and males have no value in an industry that exploits the female reproductive system, he's either killed right away or he's allowed to live for 16 weeks, and he's killed at the end of that 16 weeks. If she's female, and 50% of the male, 50% of the births are males, so we're talking about 50%. And then if she's female, she goes into the same servitude as her mother. And then I remember also thinking, well, there must be some kind of retirement spa for cows, right? There must be. We all have this notion that the cows, when they're done, when they're done, we say, when they're, when they're no longer productive, we say, right? Meaning when her life can no longer be justified by the profit that she's garnering for the industry, she is killed. And cattle can live up to 20, 25 years, but she's killed to four or five years. There is no such thing as a slaughter-free animal agriculture system. Nobody is going to keep these animals alive as pets and feed them and shelter them and, men and take care of them without getting any profit in return. So all of this, for what? For, for, for her milk? And if you were to imagine that, that offspring being able to imagine this, there was a time thousands of years ago when cattle were wild. So imagine wild cattle living in the woods, feeding off of the leaves and eating the leaves and eating the grass. They have a baby and the baby nurses and he drinks the milk which is there for him. And over time, what happens? He starts to grow and get big. And then what? He moves on to solid food and that's where he gets his nutrients from, right? I mean, that's the course of things. And we can identify with this somewhat because we nurse and then we move on to solid food. And then we're told, hang on, don't be so hasty. You now need to drink the milk of another animal whose very offspring stops drinking his mother's milk into adulthood. It makes absolutely no sense, right? And so for what? Why? Why? Why cow's milk? Why goat's milk? Why camel's milk or buffalo milk? Sheep's milk? Why? What's so special? Is there something so unique about the milk of these animals that makes it conducive to human consumption? What's so special about it? What do these animals have in common? All of those animals I just named, I said before, they're not carnivores, right? So thus, they're herbivores, good. They're herbivores, they're herd animals, they're easy to control and they're easy to keep together. It's the nature of the animals, not the nature of the milk that makes this a successful industry. If we really wanted the highest calcium milk, we should be drinking hyena's milk, have you tried hyena's milk? Amazing. I've never tried hyena's milk. But it's so high in calcium, because they eat bones, and you know. The problem with hyena's milk, it doesn't work out as a business plan, because they'd kill you if you tried to take their milk or impregnate them. The point is, if we, if we, 
If we could have taken hyena's milk, we would have, and I'm sure we tried. But it's not a great business plan. It doesn't work so well. And so that's my point. That's how arbitrary this is. If I were to even suggest, forget all the other animals, why don't we drink our own milk into adulthood? Come on, some human milk ice cream. <laughs> this crowd is so easy because they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty good. I see a couple people going, oh my God, this is awesome. Our own human, our own species milk. And people go, that's just, I mean, it's the source of, of like, you know, comedians and, and, and sitcoms. People are so disgusted by the fact that we would drink our own species milk. I mean, isn't that striking? It's just so amazing. And so my suggestion is that we skip the middle cow, go directly to the source and get all of our nutrients from the green leafy vegetables, from the bok choy, from the kale, from all of the things that has the calcium in it and skip all of that, right? I mean, you can do the same thing with the omega-3 fatty acids. You could do this with all the nutrients. You said that we're supposed to get our omega-3 fatty acids from fish. And so I ask you, where do the fish get their omega-3 fatty acids? You're too easy. I don't even know why I'm here. You should just... <laughs> they get it from the algae. They get it from the phytoplankton. But what we're doing is going through the fish to get to the nutrients, right? So we're getting the saturated fat. We're getting the animal protein. We're getting some heavy metals thrown in for good measure. A little mercury. Tasty. Tasty. Love mercury so much. And we're wiping out the fatty fish, the salmon in the East Coast. We wiped it out. We wiped it out, wiped it out on the East Coast. We're wiping it out on the West Coast, right? So then we're factory farming fish the way we factory farm land animals. And so in addition to all of those things, we get some pesticides and some herbicides. And we're still getting heavy metals because these are carnivorous fish. And where do you think we're getting the fish from? From the ocean, feeding them to the factory farmed fish. This is just so backwards. All of the resources it takes to do this, right? And we can go directly to the source for the omega-3 fatty acids as well. We can go directly to the flax seeds and the hemp seeds and the walnuts. We can go directly to DHA, which is, the, which is what our bodies convert these EFAs, these essential fatty acids, into. And guess where? Well, there's some that are sourced, obviously, from fish. But where is the DHA sourced from? From algae. So you can get algae-sourced DHA. You can do this with protein. Everybody protein. Where's it get your protein? You have to tell me where to get your protein. I don't need protein. I try being vegan, but I need a protein. And I said, well, how do you... Wow, that, how did that look? Like, what did that feel like? I don't know, I just really needed some protein. I need some protein, where's the protein? And I said, well, I don't understand. Like, what did it feel like that you needed protein so badly? I was, I was tired, so I needed some protein. I'm like, well, that's not protein deficiency. Like, that's just a calorie deficiency, right? Calories, energy. Well, I don't know, I, my doctor said I was anemic. Okay, that's iron, that's not protein. No one could tell me what protein deficiency looks like, but everybody's protein deficiency. D deficient, if they don't have meat for like a day. I tried for a day and I really needed protein. <laughs> Nobody even knows what it looks like, right? Can you, and it, you know what, let's do a little survey. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of heart disease. Anybody, anybody here? Awesome. Diabetes, anybody here diabetes? Anybody know anybody with cholesterol, lower medication on cholesterol, blood pressure, lower medication? Raise your hand if you know anybody with quashi or cor. Is there, is there a quashi or cor specialist in the house? Anybody? Is there a quashi or cor specialist at any of the hospitals here in San Francisco? You'd think we'd know someone with quashi or cor. We're so obsessed with protein deficiency. Quashi or cor is the scientific term for protein deficiency, and yet we don't know anybody with quashi or cor. We don't know any quashi or cor specialists. We know cancer wards. We know those cardiovascular wards. We don't have a quashi or cor ward, right? We don't have diseases of deficiency. We took care of that. Anybody with rickets in the house? Scurvy, anybody? Right? We don't have diseases of, deficient, of, of, of deficiency. It doesn't mean we don't want to make sure that we're getting all the nutrients we need, but we're not suffering. Those, those, the heart disease, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the high blood pressure, those are all related to, to diseases of excess, right? We've seen people with quashi or poor. If we've ever seen late night appeals for hunger organizations and we see little babies with distended bellies and they have kind of yellowing skin, right? They have quashi or core. They're not getting enough protein. Why are they not getting enough protein? Because they're starving, because they're not getting enough food. And the only time we really see people with true quashi or core in Western developed nations 
is when someone's really not eating, well, quite literally, if they're very sick or if they have anorexia, okay? But we don't, that's not what we're, that's not what we have to worry about. We have to not worry about what we're not getting enough of and worry about what we're getting too much of, all right? Does that make sense? Because I don't even want you to believe me. I just want this to make sense so that you go, well, it's just common sense. Like, you don't have to be a nutritionist to understand this stuff. It's just common sense. So those are all the myths we have around nutrition. Then we have all these myths around food, vegan food, the vegan food, vegan food. I have vegans who just, vegan food. We say vegan food like it's its own food group, right? <laughs> got vegan food, and I've got regular food. You want some normal food? You want some vegan food, right? <laughs> Can I have a vegan apple, please? <laughs> Do you have any vegan bananas? Because I really... Wait, it's food! It, it's, it's fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans and mushrooms and grains and herbs and spices. Anybody hear of the... That's vegan food. It's just food, right? We need to take vegan food out of the box called vegan. Right? And when we do that, it's just so much, it's just food, and it's less daunting, and it's less overwhelming. Because the way we couch it to non-vegans, too, they're paying attention. And they go, oh, vegan food, and then my whole etymology talk that I couldn't do this year because, you know. So, <laughs> in that whole talk, which I have a podcast on, I talk about the fact that when I hear vegans, I'm on a crusade. We use these words like, hey, would you like some fake meat? Fake. Who's gonna, oh, I want some fake food. I want some replacement food. I want a substitute. Can I have a substitute, please? I don't want the real thing. I want a substitute. We use these words, faux and fake and substitute and replacement, right? Alternative. And we think that people are gonna go, yeah, that's, the, that's what I want. They go, no, I don't eat fake food, right? So we need to stop couching this as if it's something so different. It's just food. So that's one myth around the food, okay? But I'm not stopping there. The other myths around food I really have, I have to do, I think have to do with our perception, our self-perception, right? So one of the things that happens, well, I have a, one of the things that happens when you tell someone you're vegan is they tell you what they eat. As soon as you tell them you're vegan, I didn't ask, but please tell me, I wanna know. And you say, I'm vegan, and they say, well, I'm vegan too. Well, I eat chicken, and I eat fish, but I'm vegan. And people go, but I don't, I don't understand, because there's a kingdom called animals, a kingdom called minerals, and a kingdom called vegetables and animals. Oh, and so if you're vegan, you're eating chickens, it's not, yeah. Okay, so you wanna explain that and make sure people are, people are clear about that. But a lot of people do that, and I think it's very interesting, because I think it's interesting that people recognize that there is a value in identifying as a vegetarian or vegan. I think it's, I think it's fantastic that people say, I'm vegan, but I eat chickens. They don't say chickens, I say chickens. Because they want to identify as that. They see there's something, there's something positive about that. So then you can have the conversation about the different kingdoms and just kind of talk to them about that. But what often happens is that you tell someone you're vegan, and they say, I don't eat a lot of meat. I'm fine, I don't eat a lot of meat. Have you ever, I've never met anybody who didn't say, I don't eat a lot of X, meat, dairy, eggs, whatever, right? This happens every time, every single time. Nobody says, oh, I eat so much meat and so much dairy, like you can't even believe it. And I eat the most violently procured, animally food, the meat, I, I, as bloody as possible. No, everybody says, I'm, oh, I just do the humane ones, they're prayed to, they're sung to, they're incense burning, right? We have a ritual and we love them, poetry. That's, that's their perception, because we have this perception of ourselves and then we have reality and they're not always the same. So these people don't want to believe that they're contributing to something violent. We want to have the perception that we're good people, and I think we are good people, but our behavior isn't necessarily matching our, our perception of ourselves. So there's nobody I meet who doesn't say, I don't eat a lot of meat. The truth is you don't know how much you eat until you stop. You really don't. These are habits we're talking about. These are habits that have been ingrained in us from the very beginning, right? And that's the good news, and that's the bad news. It's the bad news because we are fierce creatures of habit. We are fierce creatures of habit. But it's the good news because habits are meant to be broken. And so the whole idea, I mean, this is the principle behind the work I do. This is the principle behind my 30-Day Vegan Challenge. It's an online program where I literally guide people through the process of becoming vegan because it's really a matter of creating a new foundation. Because what's happening in our lives is we look in this direction our whole lives, right? We're choosing the same foods over and over, we're going to the same restaurants over and over. We're picking the same items on those restaurant menus over and over. And then we go, yeah, vegan seems really hard. It seems really limiting, they say. And we're picking the same thing. I know 
how people eat who are not vegan. I was one of them once, right? But we're picking the same things over and over. There is so much less variety in a non-vegan diet because we're just picking things out of habit. And then when you do something where you go, I'm just gonna stop for a little bit, long enough to recognize my habits, like the 30 day vegan challenge, for instance. Then you go, oh, I'm gonna have them. Oh wait, I'm not, I'm not eating that. So what's over here? Oh my God, there's like beautiful things over here and there's foods and there's vegan bananas and things that I never, <laughs> I never knew, right? It was here the whole time, but we weren't looking in that direction. And that's what this is a matter of. This is a matter of literally changing our gaze from over there to over here, and then this becomes the new habit. This becomes second nature. Does that make sense? These are habits. Three weeks to change a habit. I like 30 days, nice and round. It's your full month. But really, three weeks to change a habit. And that's really what happens. Because the problem is I think that people who make the ch change and then go back, I think it's because they removed things that were familiar to them and they didn't replace them with new things. And so they're kind of flailing about without a foundation. So it's a matter of replacing those habits with new ones, okay? And then those habits become second nature. Speaking of nature, one of the other myths that people hold with them when they say, if you're here, have you ever heard anybody say, I've tr I tried being vegetarian, I tried being vegan, but I really craved meat? Did you ever hear anybody say that? Really craved meat? And I said, no, you weren't. You weren't craving meat. And I said, no, I really was. I was, I was just craving <laughs> my protein. I was craving, I was craving meat. And I said, no, you weren't. And I said, no, I really was. I had a burger and it felt so good. It was what I needed. And I said, you weren't craving meat. We are not obligate carnivores. We are not lions on the Serengeti who see gazelles run by and we chase after them so that we could have lunch, right? That is not who we are. If you want to see what a, what a, what a car carnivore looks like, an obligate carnivore, think about a domestic cat, right? You've all seen domestic cats see a bird, right? If you're in the room, they could care less about you. You're not there anymore. It's all about the bird. And they get down really low and their eyes dilate and they're completely focused and their tail starts to flicker, and their teeth start to chatter, and they drool a little bit, and they make this funny little chirping sound. That's how you get when you see a bird fly past you or through that window, or through the window, into the window, past the window. If you see a deer grazing on the side of the road, is that how you get? You're not answering, I'm really scared. Please, please say. Good. Because we have help for you. We have a whole conversion program for you. That's not how we get, right? That's not how we react. We are not all the good carnivores. We do not even act that way if we see an animal who's been hit by a car on the side of the road, right? When we see an animal who's hit by a car, our first reaction, I can see it in some of your faces, it happens every time, our first reaction is kind of disgust. And our second reaction is compassion both simultaneously. We hope they weren't hurt. We hope they didn't suffer, right? We don't take out our forks and start thinking about lunch, right? That's not who we are. We, are, we do not crave the flesh of other animals. But we do crave fat, we crave salt, we crave texture, we crave familiarity, we crave flavor. And I want you to know I'm using this word crave very loosely because we tend to use this word crave when we want something that's really about desire to sound much more legitimate. Because if you just said, oh, I really desired protein, doesn't, doesn't ring as much, right? You really desired, really desired me. You'd go, oh, well that's really selfish and that's, you know, you can make a different decision but you're, you just really desire it because that's really what it's about. But if you say, I crave it, well, then there's a scientific reason behind why I want to eat that meat, right? So I use the word crave very loosely. I think it's a word that we use because we want to legitimize something that really is more of habit and more about pleasure and desire. But, but we do, we are used to, our, our palates are accustomed to the fat and the salt that has been coating them for so long when we were eating all of these animal products. And so what we do when we're switching, you know, when we're going from animal-based to plant-based, it doesn't mean that you don't, to crave these things still. I mean, the truth is your palates do change, but you can meet those cravings with the plant foods. And that's what I really encourage people to do is identify the craving. Oh, it's fat. Okay, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Have some nuts. Put some almond butter in a smoothie, right? Have some avocado. Make some guacamole. I mean, you can get the fat that you want. If it's a certain mouthfeel, you can make something creamy. If it's something chewy that you want, you can have something chewy. If it's salt, 
some salt. It's brilliant. Well, salt. <laughs> salt. There's a salt craving, right? The point is identify the craving and then meet the craving with the plant food. Right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It's not, it's not about the animal flesh, it's not about the animal secretions, it's about the mouth feel, it's about the things that we're all used to. If we grew up eating miso soup for breakfast, that's what we would crave because that's all we know. We don't crave things we've never had before. Do you crave any vegetables you've never had? Vegetables, exotic vegetables in other lands that we've never had? We don't crave, we don't crave things we've never had before. So it's about our habits, it's about our palates, right? And then people complain, they say, well, I would be vegan, I would do it, but I'd have to chop vegetables. And they start whining <laughs> about the vegetables they'd have to chop. They go, I don't want to have to chop them, and I have run too tired, and I'm busy, and I don't have time to chop any vegetables. And I think, oh my god, are you eating any vegetables? <laughs> because it's not only vegans who should be eating vegan vegetables. <laughs> It's everybody who should be eating vegetables, but we make this excuse, I don't have to try them, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. Everybody, nobody's time, right? Everybody's it's busy, I don't have time, right? I don't have time to chop some vegetables. The problem is that right now, our barometer for how much time we should spend in the kitchen is about zero. And if I suggest, well, can you spend 10 minutes in the kitchen? Well, that's a big jump from zero, so I don't know about that. But it's 10 minutes we're talking about, because it doesn't take much longer than that. 10, 15 minutes, right? Because everybody complains they don't have time to chop some vegetables. It's such a mental game. It is not even about the time. It's about our mental game. The truth is we really do have time. We're just not using the time we have to chop some vegetables. We're always deciding what to do with our time, right? And yet everybody complains they don't have time to chop some vegetables, but they have time to get in a car and drive to a restaurant and look for a parking spot, which takes a long time here in San Francisco, and get into the restaurant and wait for a table and sit down and decide what to order and wait for the food and eat the food and then wait for the check and drive back home again and look for that parking spot. And yet they don't have time to chop some vegetables. I think we probably have time to chop some vegetables. So it's another one of these things that we sabotage. We sabotage ourselves. This isn't just the industry telling us how to eat and what to eat. This is us sabotaging our own desires, right? Our own values. This is what we really want to do, but I'm not going to do it, and I'm going to blame someone else for it because I'm too busy, right? We do have time to chop some vegetables. I'm talking about 10 or 15 minutes a day. One of the things that happens is that people have this block when they buy vegetables and they're really excited to eat differently and eat healthfully and they get all the vegetables, and you put them in the refrigerator, and then you go to eat them, and you look at the carrots that have their tops on, and you go, oh my God, it's so cool. And the broccoli in the bunch, and the cauliflower in the head, and you go, oh my God, this is gonna take forever. I'm hungry now, I wanna eat now, I am hungry. And then you call the pizza guy, because you don't wanna chop the vegetables, and you wait for the pizza guy. So you have the time to wait before you eat. I'm just suggesting chop the vegetables and eat the vegetables because then people have this contest to see how long it takes before the vegetables compost in their refrigerator, right? Because people go, well, how do you get them to last longer? How can you get them to like hold longer? People have given me tips. Some guy said once, he said, I figured out, I found this way. I have had celery in my refrigerator for 30 days. I figured out how to hold that celery and keep it from going bad. And I said, well, why did you buy the celery? Didn't you buy the celery to eat the celery? Like, why are you buying the celery? It's not meant to just sit in the refrigerator. It's meant to be eaten, right? It's not meant to, you're not meant to have a compost contest, right? But that's what we do when the vegetables go bad. Why did they go bad? How do you keep them longer? Here's a tip. Eat them. That's the way to stop the vegetables from going bad in your refrigerator. I know. It's just... It's brilliant, it's just amazing. I've been thinking about this for 15 years. It's brilliant, it just comes to me, just amazing. There's a tip. I do recommend though, I really do think we do have these blocks. And so I recommend, and this is again, it's just kind of a mind game. Before you put all the vegetables in the refrigerator, just chop them up a little bit, take the tops off the carrots, you know, kind of make the broccoli and the cauliflower into florets. It really takes 10 minutes, you know, once you have your cutting board out, really use it. You have your knife out. If you have a recipe you're following and it calls for one onion, chop two onions, put one in the refrigerator, and then put one in the recipe, right? So you're always thinking ahead. You're always planning ahead. You can even buy vegetables, amazing, that are already chopped up for you because they figured out people don't want to chop vegetables. There's a like anti-chopping vegetable movement going on. And they figured out, well, maybe if we chop them first for them, they'll eat them and buy them. 
And yes, they're more expensive, but we're always deciding whether we want to spend our time or we want to spend our money. We're making that decision all the time. Maybe one week you have the money, you want to do it because you don't have as much time, fine, do it. Buy them chopped in advance. Another week you might say, I'm going to take a couple hours to just make a bunch of things on a Sunday or just take 15 minutes to chop the vegetables or whatever it is, right? And then you have the people who go, well, I know that sounds really great, but I think I heard that you're going to lose the nutrients in those vegetables if you chop them in advance and put them in the refrigerator. So I'm really concerned. I don't want to do that. I don't want to lose those nutrients. And then I ask them, well, how many vegetables are you eating now? And they go, yeah, not so many. I need some more vegetables. And I said, well, here's a tip. Vegetables chopped in advance. Wait for it. <laughs> have more nutrients than no vegetables at all, <laughs> right? Brilliant, amazing stuff. And <laughs> amazing. So we sabotage ourselves all the time. We're the ones who are sabotaging ourselves, and there are things that we can do, little tricks we can play with our minds and our behavior that actually help us to get through this sabotage and actually help us manifest the values we really have, right? I mean, these are the things that we need to do. I mean, I hear people say, you know, a lot of people say, I could do it, I could, I could absolutely give up X, Y, and Z, but I could never give up A, whatever. And the A is usually... Cheese. So people say that, right? People say, I could give up everything, but I could, I could never give up cheese. And then I say, well, what, do you, what do you eat? It's a good start, so what do you eat now? And they go, well, everything. And I said, well, I don't, if you could give up everything except cheese, why don't you give up everything except cheese? The idea that we do nothing at all because we think we have to do everything doesn't make any sense. It's another self-sabotage, right? Don't do nothing because you can't do everything. Do something, anything. Every step we take will bring us closer to the people we want to be and to the animals we want to help. But to do nothing at all because we think we have to do everything doesn't make any sense. Totally self-defeatist. Right? So these are all the ways that we just totally sabotage ourselves. And I see this in the social aspects too. I know a lot of people who say that they are already vegan, but they don't tell anybody. <laughs> there are vegan, there are people in like these vegan closets, closets because they're made of vegan bananas. And they're in the vegan closet because, or they say I would be vegan, but I don't want to call attention to myself. You know, people who, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like, I don't want to call attention to myself. I don't want to appear different, right? There's this notion, people who really don't want to step out and kind of identify as vegan because they don't want to kind of call attention to themselves or rock the boat. And it's interesting because we live in a culture where we say we value individuality. We value individuality. I actually don't think we value individuality at all. I think we value conformity. Nonconformist is a dirty word in most people's vocabulary. And yet everybody says they want to make a difference. Everybody says I want to affect change and live a meaningful life and do something meaningful. And I believe people when they say these things, but I wonder if all of these things mean as much to them as not appearing different. We all say we want to make a difference, but I think we forget that in order to make a difference, we may have to do something different. It's only people who step out of their comfort zones and stretch their comfort zones and stand up for who they are and stand up for what they believe in that have an impact. It's easy to go along with the status quo. That's easy. The question we have to ask ourselves is at what cost? At the cost of our own values? At the cost of our own health? Those are pretty high costs, in my opinion. And then we have people who say, well, I'm vegan at home. But when I eat out, or when I go out with friends or colleagues, I don't eat vegan because I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. It's so noble, so selfless of you. You really want to be vegan, but you don't want to do so because you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. And I think this is one of the things we tell ourselves. It becomes another excuse that we use to actually stop us from really doing what we want to do. Because I don't get this. Anybody who knows me, anybody who meets me, knows where I stand on certain issues. Namely, that animals are not here for me. They're here for their own sake. They're not here for my pleasure. That's not something I have to apologize for. That's not something that changes according to who invites me to dinner or who I might, who I might make uncomfortable. Not telling someone I don't eat animals because I think it might make them uncomfortable. Who am I? How do I know? I think it's ironic because as, as martyrish as that sounds, as selfless as that sounds, as noble as that sounds, I think it's incredibly self-centered. 
If I were to walk around trying to anticipate someone else's reaction as if they're thinking about me all the time, I don't want to tell someone I'm vegan because I'm like, how do I know how they're going to respond? I have no idea how they're going to react. How do I know that me telling them that I'm vegan doesn't awaken some compassion in them? How do I know, I mean, who am I to even deny them the chance to like, show me that they care about me and make a dinner for me, whatever it is. Because the truth is, I never see people at their most beautiful, and I mean this, than when I, from my heart, say, I'm vegan, which I think is the most powerful statement because it means I'm manifesting my values in my behavior. I'm manifesting my compassion in my behavior. And I say, I'm vegan, and they say, I'm, I, I've been thinking about being vegan. I really want to be vegan, but I have so many questions. There's so many myths and misconceptions out there. Can you help me? Can you answer some questions for me? Or they say, I love my dog. I feel guilty every time I eat animals, but I'm afraid it's going to upset my husband, whatever it is, can, can, you, can you help me? What would you do about this? Or they say, I've been cooking vegan more and I have some wonderful recipes. Can I make a dinner for you? I would love to make dinner for you. That's their choice, right? And I always appreciate it. But I think we underestimate people. I think we, we don't give them the benefit of the doubt. And as long as we think we're protecting them from discomfort, we're not only denying our own ethics, and perpetuating violence against animals, or also potentially denying someone else their own transformation, because how else does that occur than through honest, open communication with one another? In other words, if my being vegan does make someone uncomfortable, that's not mine. That's not mine to worry about. Whatever someone does with my values isn't mine to worry about. We have to know where we end and another person begins, right? But that doesn't mean we get to be um, rude or ungracious. It means that we need to speak our truth without being attached to how that truth will affect another person, right? That's what it's about. That's ultimately what it's about. I think we underestimate others, we underestimate ourselves. And as long as we keep walking around saying there's something extreme and radical about eating fruits and vegetables, and nuts and seeds, and beans and grains, and herbs and spices, that's crazy. As long as we walk around saying that there's something extreme by not eating the mutilated bodies and stolen secretions of non-human animals, the more we keep telling ourselves these things, the less we'll expect of ourselves, and the less we'll expect of others, and nothing will change. But if we raise the bar, and have some expectations of ourselves, we see amazing things take place. Amazing things that enable people to actually manifest the values they say they have and want to manifest, right? Because one thing I know for sure is that the problems we have in this world are not because we have so much compassion, we don't know what to do with it. The problems we have in this world are because people are not living according to their own values. It's one thing to say that we're against violence and cruelty, most of us are. It's quite another to actually manifest those values in our behavior. And that's my hope for all of us, that's my hope for the world, is that each one of us reflects in our daily choices our deepest values and realize that we have the power with each bite we take, with everything we buy, with everything we do, to create the compassionate world we all envision. And may it be so. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I'll make this fast. I know everyone's impressed with it. been sitting a long time, and it's okay, and the vendors want to talk to people. I'll say this. So the question was, he became vegan five years ago. He came out full on, fully compassionate, eating McDougal style, so no oil, you know, so it's, it's, it's you know, more detailed than just vegan bananas. And then, um, and since then, you know, your family reacted in such a way that was kind of defensive, and they act like they want to talk about it, but they really don't want to hear about it. So there's a couple things I'm going to say, and I'll say it briefly. One is my podcast, because I talk about this at length in my podcast. Because I talk about the difference between us having an agenda when we're talking to people, and us just speaking our truth and planting seeds. And there's a difference, and people respond to it. So I know when we feel so passionately about this, and we feel so strongly about it, we want to meet people and go, it's amazing, it's just the best thing in the world, and I feel so good, and you got to know about that. And we don't know that that's the energy that we're actually putting out there, and people go, whoa, oh boy, and they just back up. And then they're gonna fight, they're gonna push back, and they're, they're, they're gonna get defensive, and they're gonna deflect it, right? So there's a difference between that and, yeah, I'm, I'm vegan and it's, ama it's amazing and I love it so much. There's this kind of openness that invites them to ask questions authentically and not feel that they have to react to something that you're throwing at them. So a lot of it, honestly, is how we, how we present it, okay? So check out my podcast. It's on iTunes. It's called Food for Thought. It's free. There's been seven years of content on there and I talk about that at great length. Thank you. I'm going to let everybody go so you can go have fun. Have a wonderful weekend.